It is the best-selling book in history. No volume ever written has been more loved and quoted. And its words, sometimes simple and sometimes mysterious, should always be studied carefully. It is the Bible, the Word of God. Welcome to Bible Answers Live, providing accurate and practical answers to all your Bible questions. Our phone lines are open. If you have a Bible-related question, give us a call now at 800-GOD-SAYS. That's 800-463-7297. Now, here's your host from Amazing Facts International, Pastor Doug Batchelor. Hello, friends. Would you like to hear an amazing fact? When Helen Viola Jackson died December 16, 2020, in a Marshfield, Missouri nursing home, she was the last Civil War widow. Now, the Civil War was over in 1865. That's 155 years ago. So you might be wondering how this is possible. Well, it came about when Jackson was a 17-year-old schoolgirl, and her father asked if she could help look after a neighbor, a 93-year-old Civil War veteran named James Bolin. Bolin had fought during the Union, uh, fought for the Union in the border state of Missouri. To repay her kindness, Bolin offered to marry Jackson, which would allow her to receive his soldier's pension after his death. This was a very tempting offer during the Great Depression. With the help of a local pastor, they wed September 4, 1936 at Bolin's home. Throughout their three years of marriage, he continued living at home and assures there was no intimacy. After Bolin's death in 1939, she never applied for his pension. Viola was too ashamed of the scandal of a 17-year-old marrying a man in his 90s. She never told her parents, her siblings, or anyone else about the wedding. And she never remarried, spending decades harboring this secret. Only in recent years, she came forward telling her pastor the truth, and the county and military records confirmed her story. Jackson also kept a Bible that James Bolin gave her, in which he wrote about the marriage. So when Viola Jackson died, December 2020, at 101 years of age, she was almost certainly the last remaining widow of a Civil War soldier. After Boland's relatives found out about Jackson's role in his life, they went to the nursing home and presented her with a framed photo of him. They said she broke down and cried and kept stroking the frame, saying, This was the only man who ever loved me. <laughs> Friends, you know the Bible says there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Stay with us. We're going to learn more on this edition of Bible Answers Live. You're listening to Bible Answers Live, accurate and practical answers to your Bible questions. Welcome, friends, once again to Bible Answers Live. And if you have a Bible question, we are live and the phone lines are open and you can call with your question. The number is 800-463-7297. That's 800, God says, brings your question into the studio. And we also have another number we give out for the free resources. So you might want to have something to write with. There's always plenty of books we make available for people to study out Bible subjects. We are also streaming. If you want to watch what's happening here in the studio online, and that's simply the Doug Batchelor Facebook page or the Amazing Facts Facebook page. And I think soon we're going to be streaming on YouTube Live as well. And so we look forward to you ha having you call in with our questions. If you call in, you don't get picked up right away. Just uh, let it ring a minute and our operators will get to you. My name is Doug Batchelor. My name is John Ross. Good evening, friends. And past the day, as we always do, let's start with prayer. Dear Father, we thank you that uh, once again we have this opportunity to study your word. And uh, we thank you that uh, we can join in wherever we might be as we mm -hmm. search the scriptures. We pray your Holy Spirit would be with us here in the studio and be with those who are listening, wherever they might be, driving their car, at home, whatever the mm -hmm. case. And just ask your guidance in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Pastor, you opened the program telling a story about well, it's quite remarkable. Um, yeah, sure enough, the oldest remaining widow of a Civil War veteran died last month. It's incredible. <laughs> you know, talking about people getting married at old ages before the program, we were talking about after the death of Sarah, Abraham remarried, and we did a little math. Uh, 100 and must have been somewhere around 137 yes. years of age. Yeah, it tells us that one of the few women in the Bible where it gives her age when she died is Sarah. Matter of fact, she may be the only one. 
and Sarah died at 127. She was 90 when Abraham was 100, and they, she gave birth to Isaac. After her death, Abraham uh, still must have had some zip in his hip, and he married again and had several other children. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, but um, this is an interesting story, and um, she, she was ashamed of it for years, but finally when she told her pastor, he said, that's remarkable. That makes you one of the last Civil War widow uh, veteran widows <laughs> and so uh, pretty soon everybody in her town sort of made her a hero but um, you know it made me think about a verse in the Bible when uh, Viola was saying that no one ever really loved her except this war veteran it reminded me that uh, there's a lot of people who go through life and wonder does anyone really love me you know she never married again and she may have felt very isolated and alone as many do right now but I want you to know friends you are not alone Jesus has promised, I'm with you wherever you go. And you can read in Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am persuaded, Paul says, that there neither life or death or angels or principalities or powers or things present or things to come or height or depth or any other created thing is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Do you know about that love? There's somebody who really does love you. Even though there's tribulation and problems in the world, this person loves you so much they gave their life that you might live if you choose to believe and follow him. And we'd like to share a book that tells you about how you can experience that love and that gift of everlasting life. Have you ever thought about it, friends? Why not now? I think we're near to the second coming of Jesus, and it's a good idea to get to know him now if you don't know him yet. We've got a free book called Three Steps to Heaven we'd like to make available. And that is available to anyone who would like to call and ask. I just asked for the book. It's called Three Steps to Heaven. And the number to call is 800-835-6747. That is the resource phone line. Ask the book Three Steps to Heaven. We'll be happy to send it to anyone in North America. If you're watching outside of North America, we encourage you to go to the website, amazingfacts.org, and you can read it for free at the website on our uh, library there. <laughs> but if you'd like a hard copy, we'll get in the mail to you this week. 800-835-6747 is the resource phone line. Going to go to the phone lines. We've got Anthony listening in New York. Anthony, welcome to the program. Uh, good evening, pastors. How are you? Doing well. Thank you for calling. Okay, great. Um, my question uh, comes from Deuteronomy uh, chapter 18, verse 21 and 22. Okay. Um, and it's basically, uh, I want to expound on it a little bit, but it's how do we distinguish between a failed prophecy and a conditional one? And I ask this question because I, I see more and more, I belong to a denomination where we believe in the gift of prophecy was manifested in one of God's servants. And um, I hear a lot of people, you know, speaking against it by saying, oh, well, the prophecy didn't come true. So that shows that she's a false prophet. Um, but I believe that there were conditional prophecies, but I'm just not sure how we can show from the Bible how to determine which one is conditional and when a prophecy is a failed prophecy. Okay, fair enough. You know, and many people, when they think about conditional prophecies, they think, well, didn't Jonah go into Nineveh and say 40 days in Nineveh will be destroyed? That was clearly a conditional prophecy. They were going to be destroyed because of their wickedness, but God is not willing that any should perish. And so when the city went through a very intense repentance and they turned away they fasted they prayed they turned from their wickedness god said well look I, i'm gonna postpone this judgment even wicked king ahab elijah said that he was gonna you know his uh, dynasty was going to be destroyed and when he got that word after killing naboth he humbled himself greatly and god says because he's humbling himself i'm going to postpone that judgment and it didn't happen until after Abra ah ahab's death and uh, so, you know, God sometimes will postpone uh, certain judgments that are given in a prophecy if people repent. He never wants to just destroy anyone. He'd always prefer that they repent. Even Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar, he said, how do I avert this judgment that I'm, I dreamed about? Daniel said, put away your sins by righteousness and it'll be a lengthening of your tranquility. So, you know, that's one important aspect, Anthony. And, uh, and you know, many prophets, if a true prophet makes a prophecy, you know, it's like Joshua said, and Pastor Ross, I, you might help me find where 
Joshua said, all that God has promised has happened. Not one word has fallen to the ground of all that God, the, the good word. I think you might type in fall into the ground or something. And, and um, he said, everything that Moses had prophesied happened. Now, that was all the good things about giving them the promised land. Moses also prophesied a lot of judgments, and they also happened. Uh, but they took hundreds of years. He said, if you turn away from the Lord, you're going to be carried off captive. You're going to be besieged by your enemies. And all those things happened. I don't know if you've run on to that one. Still working on that one. Yeah, first, okay. <laughs> anyway, um, but um, I, I th think it might be when uh, Joshua, he also says, um, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's, I think, just before or after that. But um, hope that helps a little bit, Anthony. And, uh, and then, of course, in Deuteronomy, it says if a prophet makes a prophecy and it doesn't come true, in most cases, it means they're a false prophet. Right. And we do have that study guide that talks about that. It's called Does, in Does God Inspire Psychics and Astrologers? And we'll be happy to send that to anyone wanting to learn more about what does the Bible say about the gift of prophecy? Is it still relevant today? And if you'd like to receive that study guide, the number is 800-835-6747. And ask for the study guide. It's study guide, uh, I don't know the exact number, but ask for it. It says, Does God Inspire astrologists and psychics that's the name of the study guide and we'll mm -hmm. be happy to send that out to anyone who asks we've got george listening from new jersey george welcome to the program uh good evening pastors how you doing tonight doing well thanks for calling uh, uh by the way pastor doug i've been watching you on the ion network that you're now on so just so oh that's right I'm first of the year we're on now praise the lord just yes, went on heard there. you this morning yep uh, the question I have uh, tonight, uh, last week I, I didn't call, but I heard you talking about the transfiguration last last week, uh -huh. and you said that Moses was um, resurrected to be part of that, which I tend to believe, believing in conditional immortality. The only thing I have a problem with in trying to reconcile that with Christ is the first fruits of those who slept. You see what I'm saying, mm -hmm. uh, which is, I guess, in Corinthians or someplace. And plus we have Enoch and Elijah. Of course, they didn't die. They were translated, I guess. How would you reconcile the, that, that statement? Christ is the first fruits when, of course, Moses was already resurrected, you know, while Christ was living. Yeah, well, when, when you took a first fruit from the harvest, you didn't take one piece of grain. You usually took a bundle. And so Christ would still qualify as first fruit if technically Moses was still resurrected. So, uh, you know, you, you can't look at a lot of people that were resurrected. You think about in the great resurrection at the second coming when the dead in Christ rise, you're looking at right. millions of people. And so compared to the millions that will be resurrected and even the, you know, the group of people that were resurrected at the resurrection of Christ, there was a smaller group. It says many of those that slept in the graves when there's this earthquake, the graves open and they arose from their graves and appeared to many in the city. Now, that's only in the Gospel of Matthew. But even right. that's another, a bigger group. But compared to those groups, you know, Jesus and maybe Moses before him, he said Jesus still qualifies as the first fruit. And I think also the first, so the first fruit is not necessarily in... Sequential. Yes, not numerical value as in one two three but rather in position and authority importance so uh, and importance so it's through christ's that's resurrection that any others can hope to be resurrected well that's what i was thinking like he was the chief one or the head one you know yeah or others followed him when mm -hmm. you call the president's wife the first lady you don't mean she was the first lady in the u.s you mean that she right. is the first in standing as far as you know a position of right. dignity so a good point oh that helps a lot. Thank you. All right. Thank you, George. Appreciate your call. We've got uh, Marie listening in Canada. Marie, welcome to the program. Hi. Yes. Good evening to both of you, Pastor, uh, Bachelor and Rose. Thank you very much for taking my call. Thank you. Uh, and I hope you understand my strong French accent as well. Yeah? You're from yeah. a French part of Canada. I am, yes. <laughs> That's all right. We'll do our best. But, uh, yeah, how can we good. help you tonight? <laughs> That's fine. If I speak too fast, please let me know. I have a quick question. Uh, it's concerning, actually, um, the uh, chapter number, sorry, a book of Numbers, chapter 12. Yes. And uh, that will be, it starts, actually, with uh, verse 1, when Aaron and uh, Miriam are criticizing, are well, looking down on Moses' wife. Mm -hmm. And in verse 10, uh, God's being upset 
actually, um, Miriam, big, she's, uh, she has leprosy, mm-hmm. and she's becoming white as snow. Now, my question is, and I'm, uh, I hope actually, uh, you know, not uh, going to confuse you with that, I was thinking of racism. So, of course, with what's been happening last summer in the U.S. Mm-hmm. and worldwide, actually, with the, you know, um, riots against racism, mm-hmm. we know that even the state of prophecy was against it. She denounced it, and that's why she was kind of banished to Australia. And uh, my question is, um, with that text of number, uh, can we actually say, can, can we safely say that God is really upset when actually uh, you have those actions of racism for him just to uh, make sure that Miriam had leprosy and being white as snow? Can we say that, please? Well, all right, let's talk about that, Marie. That's a great question. Uh, first of all, just to give our listeners a background, uh, Miriam's asking about Numbers 12, and the story here is Mar- Moses was the youngest of the three siblings, Aaron, Miriam, Moses. It's almost like a God used this trinity. <laughs> One of them was a spiritual prophetess, and then you had Aaron, the older brother, and then you have Moses, and uh, they helped, that family helped lead the people out. But um, Moses had married, the Bible says he had married an Ethiopian. Now, we don't know if it's talking about Zipporah, who is a Midianite, but the Midianites, they that may have been considered part Ethiopian, but they were definitely uh, entertaining some prejudice against against Zipporah or Moses' wife. Uh, and um, and they were punished for that. So uh, I think it is a statement that's being made that um, God is no respecter of persons. And the Bible tells us that God has made all nations of one blood. And that, uh, you know, when people express that kind of discrimination, God is not pleased. He not only judged Miriam, he later forgave Miriam. She had leprosy, but he healed her. But Jesus also told the Jewish nation, even his own apostles were often prejudiced, uh, looking upon Gentiles as dogs. And uh, Jesus said, you know, many are going to come from the east and west and sit down in the kingdom with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And some of the natural children are going to be in outer darkness. Just like Miriam was cast out of the camp because of her leprosy. So I think that the Lord is telling us there that um, he does not uh, approve of uh, you know, racism or that kind of prejudice or discrimination. Well, the Bible tells us that um, God is not a respecter of persons. Yeah. Man looks at the outward, God looks at the heart. Exactly. So um, I think as Christians, as followers of Christ, you know, even, even in the time of Jesus, there was definitely a lot of hostility and racism between the Jews and the Samaritans and the Greeks and the Romans and we find Jesus ministering to all groups of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, where he, he spoke to her and gave her hope and uh, life. And so Christ sets the example. Mm-hmm. Sets the example of uh, we're all brothers and sisters in him. And Yes. All right. Well, thank you, Marie. That's, that's a good point you brought up there. We've got Donna in Missouri. Donna, welcome to the program. Donna, you may have your mute on. Are you there? Uh, I, I'm Donna, but I'm in Montana. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Had the wrong abbreviation. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good evening, pastors. Good evening. Um, my question, my question is this, um, after Jesus was resurrected, he saw Mary Magdalene and he told her not to touch him because he had not yet ascended to his father. Yes. But then, uh, day, I guess it was days later, he was with the disciples, uh, again, and Thomas, who had doubted that it was Jesus, Jesus said to Thomas, thrust your ha- hand into my side. So why did he tell Mary not to touch him, but Thomas could touch him? Yeah, that's. I'm glad you asked that question because it's often misunderstood. And if you read it in the King James Version, in the Old English, when Jesus said, do not, de- do not touch me, the word there in Greek means cling to me. He was getting ready to ascend to heaven, and Mary, when she saw him, she fell at his feet and maybe reached out to grab his feet, and he said, Mary, do not detain me. As a matter of fact, I think some translations word it that way, Pastor Ross, in John chapter 8, do not, de- uh, rather, John 20, 
do not detain me for I have not yet ascended because after Jesus ascends to heaven comes back down he sees the disciples and he says all hail and they worship him so he didn't want Mary to be so excited that she was clinging to him that he could not ascend and have his sacrifice declared victorious and successful then he came back of course that Sunday evening and he met with uh, met with several of the disciples actually so it, he wasn't telling Mary, don't touch me. He was saying, don't cling to me. Does that help a little bit? Yes. I read, I read the King James, so that's, yeah, that's, I, I understand that now. Yeah, I asked the same question when I first encountered that. I said, that doesn't sound like Jesus. Don't touch me. Because Jesus yeah, was always I very think. good about letting people come. And he, Jesus would even you know, reach out and touch lepers. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. Appreciate that. And um, I was just thinking, you know, we have... Uh, we've got that book. Um, there's a book called At Jesus' Feet. Oh, yeah. And you could probably contact Amazing Facts, and I think they've got a very inexpensive sharing version of that book about Mary Magdalene and her encounter with Jesus. All right. Thanks for your call, Donna. We've got Kate listening in Brooklyn, New York. Kate, welcome to the program. Hello. Hi. You're on. How are you? Oh, hi. Um Hi, Pastor Doug and uh, Pastor Ross. Thank you for your time. Uh, my question is about people who lived before Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, they uh, did not know the salvation of Jesus Christ's blood, and how are they going to be saved? Is it by their good deeds and sacrifices, like in old days? Thank you so much. Good question, Kate. Thank you. Um, nobody is going to be saved because of their good works, um, because, you know, everyone is saved by the grace of God. There may be some, I expect there will be, who maybe were born before the time of Christ, or they were born in countries that never heard about Jesus. And I think in Romans 1 uh, and in other places, it says that, um, you know, God looks on the hearts of people, and there, there are people who are barbarians that maybe didn't even know about God, but God's law was written in their heart, and they walked in all the light they had. And um, uh, in Acts, it says that he that does good in every nation God, is accepted by God. So, uh, you know, the Lord, I think, is going to extend his grace and mercy to people that had no opportunity to hear the gospel. But they walked in all the light that the Holy Spirit and maybe angels communicated to them. And we'll be surprised to see some people in the kingdom that are just there by God's interve intervening. Mm -hmm. But as you mentioned, Pastor Doug, everyone is saved through the sacrifice mm -hmm. of Christ. Those before the cross look forward in faith. We get to look back in faith. Yep. All right. Thank you for your call. We've got, uh, let's see, I believe Tony's next in Texas. Tony, welcome to the program. Good evening, both pastors. How are you? Doing well. Thank you for calling. Good. Good, good, good. My question, uh, my wife's been bugging me, and I don't have an answer, so I said, well, I'll call you guys because you have an answer. Uh, is there any scriptures in the Bible, or does the Bible talk at all about Jesus smiling and or laughing? You know, they're 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 pretty uh, they're pretty uh, detailed about everything of his life, but we don't see anything in there about him smiling and or laughing. Well, good question. You know, there's more examples in the Old Testament where it talks about God laughing. Sometimes it says God laughs at their calamity, meaning that you know mm -hmm. people, but. Um, one example I can think I can point you to that's it's sort of circumstantial, but I think it still makes the point. If you go to Luke 24, when Jesus rises from the dead, he appears to two disciples on the road to Emmaus. If you start in verse, um, yeah, you go to verse 17 and Jesus said, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? He's really criticizing the disciples for having a sad walk. I think Jesus said the gospel is good news. And he always was telling the disciples when they were afraid, he said, do not be afraid. And uh, he says, rejoice. So the word rejoice contains the word joy. And, mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't think, and, you know, Jesus had struggles and suffering in his life, no doubt. Uh, sometimes it calls him a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. But he also, uh, children were attracted to him. And I think mm. that he, he was a person who smiled a lot and they mm. were, uh, you know, aware that he was uh, a joyful person. Yeah, I, was, I, I thought maybe like um, when uh, 
night when they, when they came and told him that Lazarus was dead, and he kind of said, yeah, "He's just sleeping. Don't worry about it." I, I it seemed like he might have said that in a you know in a laughing or a smiling way, and then he went to you know to raise him. But it's not specifically said that, but I right. did see something like that happening. Well, and you know, then you have pardon me, you you have the places where Jesus does actually incorporate some humor in his teaching when he talks about now if you've got. Uh, uh, a friend and he's got a speck of sawdust in his eye and you've got a log he really uses that word you've got a log like a piece of firewood in your eye you might want to first take the firewood out of your eye before you get the speck out of your brother's eye or when jesus talks about a camel going through the eye of a needle that's you know pretty that's hyperbole it's a pretty outrageous example uh so jesus in incorporated i think some humor in his teachings as well and um I think that he certainly did smile, but, uh, you know, you don't find a specific verse that said Jesus smiled, but he does talk a lot about rejoicing. Thank you very much, Tony. Hope that helps some. We've got Joel listening in North Carolina. Joel, welcome to the program. Hi, Pastor Doug. Hi, Pastor Ross. Hi. My, no, question, yeah. is, uh, my question is about Genesis fifteen seventeen. 17. Um, I was wondering, is the 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 oven and the torch is that god the father and then the torch is is the glory that we can't we can't be around his glory yeah this is telling about when god made a covenant with abraham in genesis 15 and it says that as the sun went down and it was dark behold there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces um the Bible talks about the Shekinah glory, the glory of God, like a burning fire that entered the temple, both in the days of Moses and in the days of Solomon and even David. Um, and I think that uh, this may have been an example of the glory of God that was confirming the covenant by having his presence or his Shekinah pass between the pieces of sacrifice. And so, you know, whether it's the father or the son, I would think it's probably God, the son. Because the Bible says no man has seen the Father at any time. Any thoughts, Pastor Ross, on that? Yeah, I think it's just a further explanation. It talks about a smoking oven and a burning torch. I don't think they're two necessarily two separate beings, but rather a description of this glorious presence that came and passed through. Great significance to that, by the way, where you know, Christ is making a covenant. God's making a covenant with Abraham. And... Um, yeah, that covenant was true uh, through Abraham the Messiah came. And then, of course, the uh, the Hebrews say that that burning smoke and furnace was a reminder of the furnace of persecution the mm -hmm. nation was going to go through, mm -hmm. the descendants of Abraham were going to go through. Hey, thank you very much. I hope that helps a little bit, Joel. And um, we are coming up on our midtime break, and we have more Bible questions lined up. We see you waiting and uh, Anthony and Ivan, Orion and Damon, we're going to be back in just a moment. Stay with us. We'll get to your questions. Stay tuned. Bible Answers Live will return shortly. In six days, God created the heavens and the earth. For thousands of years, man has worshipped God on the seventh day of the week. Now, each week, millions of people worship on the first day. What happened? Why did God create a day of rest? Does it really matter what day we worship? Who is behind this great shift? Discover the truth behind God's law and how it was changed. Visit SabbathTruth.com. For life-changing Christian resources, visit AFBookstore.com. Did you know that Noah was present at the birth of Abraham? Okay, maybe he wasn't in the room, but he was alive and probably telling stories about his floating zoo. From the creation of the world to the last day events of Revelation, BibleHistory.com is a free resource where you can explore major Bible events and characters, enhance your knowledge of the Bible, and draw closer to God's Word. Go deeper. Visit BibleHistory.com. What if you could know the future? What would you do? What would you change? To see the future, you must understand the past. Alexander the Great becomes king when he's only 18, but he's a military prodigy. 150 years in advance, Cyrus had been named. Rome was 
violent, they were ruthless, they were determined. The gospel writers see his death as a fulfillment of salvation. This intriguing documentary, hosted by Pastor Doug Batchelor, explores the most striking Bible prophecies that have been dramatically fulfilled throughout history, kingdoms in time. Get your copy today. Available now on DVD, Blu-ray, or USB. For more information, visit kingdomsintime.com. You're listening to Bible Answers Live, where every question answered provides a clearer picture of God and His plan to save you. So what are you waiting for? Get practical answers about the good book for a better life today. If you have a question about the Bible or living the Christian life, call us now at 800-GOD-SAYS. That's 800-463-7297. Now, let's rejoin our hosts for more Bible Answers Live. Welcome back, listening friends, to Bible Answers Live. If you tuned in somewhere en route, this is a Bible Answer program where we invite people to call in from all over the country and the world with their Bible questions. And um, that number again is 800-463-7297. And you can also watch and I think even text in your questions going to the Facebook, Doug Batchelor Facebook page or the Amazing Facts Facebook page. And I am Doug Batchelor. My name is John Ross. And again, we want to go to the phone lines. We've got uh, Damon listening from Oklahoma City. Damon, welcome to the program. Hey, how you doing? Doing good. Oh, great, great. Um, I had I need a better understanding of a Bible verse. Mm -hmm. um, Revelation twelve, um, chapter fourteen through seventeen. Just kind of confused on what he's talking about there. All right, so Revelation twelve verses fourteen to seventeen. Yes, sir. Let me read this for our friends that are listening. But to the woman was given two wings of an eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and a times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed out water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the flood that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, this is, a, this is a, a good sermon right here. I mean, a good 45 or 50 minute sermon, but I'll do my best to give you a quick truncated answer here. The serpent is the devil. The woman here is the church, the true church. You find her in the first few verses, standing on the moon, clothed with the sun, crowned with the stars. These are the lights that God made. God said to the church, you are the light of the world. The devil's trying to put out her light and destroy her. She brings forth the man-child. She introduces the man-child to the world, and that's Christ. And uh, after the man-child is caught up to God's throne, the de Jesus is no longer within the devil's reach. The devil tries to destroy the woman. And after Jesus ascended to heaven, there was a great persecution that was turned against the church. And the church went underground. Uh, you know, they built catacombs in Rome and throughout Europe. And they fled into the mountains. And it tells us that there was a period of time for, it says for a time, a times, and half a time. That's a time period you hear mentioned several times in the Bible. In, uh, in Daniel and in Revelation, it talks about three and a half years, 42 months, which is also three and a half Jewish years, 30 days to the month. And it also calls it a time, meaning one complete year, a times, or a couple, a pair, that's two more, so one season plus two seasons is three, and the dividing of a time, half a year, three and a half. So you've got this time period keeps coming up. In the Old Testament, there the church was persecuted. Elijah fled into the wilderness, and God fed him there for three and a half years. The prophets were hidden in caves. They went underground, and God preserved the truth then. In New Testament times, there was a period from 538 to 1798, 1,260 years of persecution from the government church during the Dark Ages. And the woman fled into the wilderness and God protected her there 
and he continued to feed her with the word of God. But in the last days, the dragon is going to turn his fury once more on the church and make war. This is the final battle of Armageddon when the dragon makes war on the woman. Now, I know I, I gave you a lot. Don't we have a lesson we can offer on this? Yeah, I'm just Russ? looking at one that I think goes Bride along of Christ. with this. Yeah, the Bride of Christ is a good one. And uh, also the one right on time that I think also deals okay. with some of the time prophecies. And uh, again, this would be great for anyone wanting to learn more about the Revelation. Um, you can just call and ask for it. The number to call is 800-835-6747. Ask for the study guide. It's called Right on Time and the Bride of Christ. Both of these two study guides deal with Revelation chapter 12 and give you a lot more information, mm -hmm. especially the one, the Bride of Christ. I think you'll really enjoy that. Thank you for your call, uh, Damon. We got uh, Orion listening from California. Is it Orion? Orion, sir. Yes, welcome. Good evening. Thank you for your ministry. I thank God for your ministry. I really thank you. I'm really blessed with your ministry. My question is in regards to Mark 13, 32. Uh, would you like me to read it? Go ahead. Okay, I'm reading from NIV version, but about the, the day and the hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, mm -hmm. nor the Son, but only the Father. Now, since we don't know the days and the hour, would it be possible for us to know the year? And if it's possible for us to know the year, uh, when will it be? What right. year will it be? Possible? All right. Thank you so much, Orion. I appreciate that. Yeah, Jesus not only says in uh, Mark chapter 13, he says in Matthew 24, that day and the hour knows no one, not even the angels, but my Father only. And in Luke, he says, uh, you know, you want to look at the signs of the times. So we should keep our heads looking up so we know when the time is near. So I think God, you know, gives us plenty of signs in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21 that tell us when the time is near. But I think we ought to guard against picking a day or an hour or even a year, you know, because um, there have been a lot of people who have picked the year of Jesus coming uh, many times in history. Uh, going back probably over a thousand years, people have been picking dates. And you know what? So far, they've all been wrong. And uh, the people then get all excited and then they get discouraged. You know, they get excited like <laughs> like a caffeinated drink. And then they end up getting the depression afterward when they crash and they lose faith. So I, I think we ought to avoid picking a date. The key for a Christian is not to just know what the date is. It's to be ready to live in a state of readiness because Christ could come for you, whoever you are listening, wherever you are. You don't know if you have another day of life. And when you. When your earthly probation is over, whether you have a heart attack or you get hit by a meteor or you die from sickness, your next conscious thought is the resurrection and the judgment day. So we want to live in a, an attitude of being ready for Jesus coming. You know, we do have a study guide talking about the second coming of Christ. Mm -hmm. And it says it's entitled Anything But Secret, talking about yes. how Jesus will come and also highlights some of the, the signs that the Bible gives uh, and we'll be happy to send this to you, Orion, or anyone wanting to learn more. The number is 800-835-6747. Ask for the book. It's called Anything But Secret. It's all about the second coming of Christ. We've Absolutely. got Colton listening in Ohio. Colton, welcome to the program. Hi. Hi, Colton. How are you? Good. Um, my question is, what was Jesus like the, um, when he was a little boy? Well, it's interesting you're asking that question. I'm writing a book right now called When Jesus Was a Little Child, <laughs> and I'm, I'm studying that. But I'm sure he was like other little boys in that he probably loved uh, animals, and I expect that he, he you know, ran in the grass, or rolled in the grass, and he swung from the trees. He probably tried to help his father in the carpenter shop. And um, his dad maybe made him a little wagon or a cart he could pull around the town of Nazareth. And he probably had a pet puppy or he liked some of the animals in town. I think Jesus was a normal little boy, but he was good. He always listened to his parents. He never told a lie. He probably was always helpful for his neighbors. So um, I'll try and get you one of those books when they're done. But it's not quite ready. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Colton. Appreciate your call. <laughs> All right. We always like to hear 
the, the young people calling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Pastor, they just wrapping that one off. I, I thought of one verse where it says Jesus grew in favor with God and man. Mm -hmm. So he had a very pleasant disposition. He was helpful, as you mentioned. He was known in the village as being a helping, positive influence. And um, yeah. Bible says that I think it's where Mary and Joseph lost track of him. It says he went home and he was subject to them. Mm. So he was an obedient son. Right. Right. Yeah. All right. We've got Hannah listening in Texas. Hannah, welcome to the program. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Um, my question comes from John chapter six. Um, it says, uh, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. And then again, it says later that therefore I have said unto you that no one could come to me unless it has been granted to him by my father. So does that mean that some people can't be saved because God didn't choose them or? Well, I think that it, it also tells us in the Bible, God is not willing that any should perish. And Jesus, you know, in John 3, 16, he says, whosoever believeth in him. But I think that God sends the spirit to work in people's hearts and to strive with him. And so Jesus is saying, if you have an interest in me, it's because the father wants you to be saved. And he's sending the spirit to strive in your heart. I don't think Christ was denying that some that he wants some to be saved. I think he was saying everyone that is saved, it's because of God's pursuing them and they're responding to that pursuit. Yeah, and no, that's, that's available to anyone. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, God's not willing that any should perish. So the Holy Spirit is speaking to the hearts of all. How we respond to that mm -hmm. uh, determines whether or not we are saved. If we come to Jesus, if we respond to the prompting. So the Father is drawing. Uh, Jesus said, if I am lifted up, I shall draw all men unto myself. Mm -hmm. So the Spirit is constantly working upon the hearts of, of men and women. So that doesn't mean then that uh, God arbitrarily chooses who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost, and you have nothing to say in the matter. Yeah, and then uh, I think Paul tells us in, is it First Timothy, God who would have all men to be saved. Mm -hmm. And so he wants everyone to be saved. God is not willing that any should perish. And it's like uh, Joshua said, who, who is on the Lord's side or choose you this day who you will serve. You know, we have a book, Hannah, that I think you'll enjoy reading. It's called, Can a Saved Man mm -hmm. Choose to be Lost? And we'll send this to anyone who calls and asks. The number again for our resource phone line is 800-835-6747. And you can ask for the book. It's called, Can a Saved Man Choose to be Lost? We've got Emmanuel from Africa, from Ghana, Africa. Emmanuel, you're on the air. Hello. Good morning, Pastor Rose and Pastor Doc. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Please, how are you doing? I, your, sorry, your question? We, yeah, well, you broke up on us. You have to say that again. Uh, please, I, I was saying, how are you doing? Oh, oh we're good. doing good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, too. Please, my question this morning is um, in uh, Genesis chapter 15, verse 9. God told uh, Abraham to, to make a sacrifice with uh, some animals. Yes. A thirty dove and then uh, a heifer. So I'm asking that is animal sacrifice important in these last days? Or uh, I mean, yeah, I want to understand if animal sacrifice is necessary for yeah. Christians. All right. Well, thank you very much. And um, you know, I would say no because, uh, and you can read in is it First uh, Corinthians where Paul says that Christ is our Passover that is sacrificed for us. And when Jesus died, the veil in the curtain, the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom, indicating the end of the sacrificial system. He was the Lamb of God that took away the sin of the world. There's no purpose to shed animals' blood anymore. Yeah, and of course we have the verse in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. It says, this is a great verse, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So is there a sacrifice in the New Testament? Yes, it is the sacrifice of ourselves. We are surrendering ourselves to Christ. Of course, Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, so you can't add to that. Christ met that fulfillment when he died on the cross. There's no need for animal sacrifices, and I'm sure grateful for that. Yeah, and I think even David says in Psalm 51, the sacrifices of God are a contrite spirit, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a humble and a contrite spirit. So even in the Old Testament, you know, Malachi says, what shall I give to the Lord? Shall I offer thousands of rams and, the, and blood? And he said, here's what God wants. Do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with God. 
He's not wanting dead animals. He wants our hearts. Mm. The sacrificial system was all pointing to Jesus. Not necessary now to sacrifice. Thank you for your call. Next caller we have is Barry listening in uh, South Carolina. Barry, welcome to the program. Hello there. Thank Hi. you, Pastors, for taking my call. I, I never usually get to listen to you live. Uh, I'll hear recorded verses on WBAJ here in our area. But oh, that's uh, right. took the opportunity. And, uh, but with Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 through 7, we have uh, John, uh, who's sad because in verse 3 it says that there's no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth able to open the scroll and look upon it. And uh, I always try to look for parallels that kind of help explain stuff or time things, whether it's a prophecy or something like that. Mm -hmm. And a previous caller had had John 20 and 17, where Jesus had told Mary not to detain him. Right. And at that particular point in time, Jesus was not in heaven. He was not on the earth as a man because he had a regenerated new body, and he was not dead in the grave. Could that have satisfied that criteria here in Revelation chapter 5? Oh, I see what you're saying. That would have been a window in time where no one was available to open the book because Christ mm -hmm. was sort of uh, when, in the middle of uh, transition. Right, and then in verse 6 and 7, when he takes the scroll, that would have been him leaving Mary and going to heaven, perhaps. Yeah, I, th I think that primarily in Revelation 5 there, it's just saying that um, there's this great anticipation that the scroll mm -hmm. should be opened, and you know, assuming this is the book of life, and no one really had the right to open that book except the one who gave his blood to pay the penalty. And that was, it's the lamb who is slain that we see figured there. What do you think, Pastor Ross? Yeah, absolutely. You know, Revelation chapter 4, you have a description of the heavenly throne room, and everyone's there, the Father's there, the 24 elders, the four living creatures, except the lamb, except Christ. Jesus then appears in chapter 5. So it's almost as if the stage is set in chapter 4, and everyone's waiting for Christ. This is after his ascension. And then Jesus enters in, and he takes the scroll, and he's worthy to open the seals. And, uh, yeah, to parallel that with um, John chapter 20, where Jesus is resurrected, and he's talking to Mary Magdalene at the tomb, I think the time frame is, is right on. Mm -hmm. That occurred just before we find uh, Revelation chapter 5, where Jesus appears. Interesting. Well, you made us think tonight, Barry. We sure appreciate that. And, yeah, keep listening there. I've, I've been to... Uh, North Carolina and met a lot of the listeners to uh, WBJC. I forget what the the call sign is. That is that North it? Carolina or South that Carolina? That was yeah. That was um, the station. I think was in North Carolina, oh, okay. but it's also heard in South okay. Carolina. All right. Well, thank you, Barry. We're going to go to Joe in Connecticut. Joe, welcome to the program. Thank you for taking my call, pastors. Good evening. Evening. Uh, uh, I have a question regarding Boris. Um, uh, my church teaches that if a husband or a wife commits adultery, then divorce is allowed by the Bible. However, uh, doesn't the Bible teach that if we break one of the Ten Commandments, we have broken them all? So, for instance, if a wife or a husband uh, breaks the Sabbath commandment or breaks one of the other commandments, according to James 2, 10 to 11... They have committed adultery. And well, so, if both those things are true, then my understanding is that the Pharisees were correct and that Jesus was wrong. Well, I think if you take James the way you're interpreting it there, that would be extreme. That would be like saying, because you break one commandment, you're guilty of all. And so, if, uh, you know, if a person tells a lie, which is a sin he's just as guilty as a person who commits murder. And the Bible doesn't teach that. There are varying degrees of sin. And there are different penalties for different sins. So, you know, God, I think, is pretty clear that um, marriage is sacred and people should not be violating the marriage vows. Now, if a couple, if there's been infidelity in a marriage, Jesus doesn't say they have to get divorced. Jesus said this would be the only biblical grounds for divorce. And so, um, now I don't know, is that, does that make sense? Uh, Joe, are you still with me? Uh, to me, that doesn't make sense at all. You said Jesus said, uh, you said something that Jesus said, but my Bible says, uh, Jesus said that, uh, let not man put asunder. And he said, whosoever, whosoever, puts away his wife and marries another, commits adultery against her. 
I don't see any. Do, have either. you read where? No, I know, but it, it does say in Matthew chapter 5 and in Matthew 19, the disciples said, is there any grounds for divorce? And he said, saving for the cause of fornication. Now, actually, um, up until the time of Christ, the Jews had some rabbinical laws that they, they could divorce their wife for bad cooking. And, uh, you know, Jesus was saying, it, you know, yeah, Moses gave you permission to divorce because of the hardness of your hearts. But from the beginning, it was not so. But um, the verse you're referring to, Pastor Doug, is Matthew chapter 5, verse 32, mm -hmm. um, where it specifically mentions there, except for um, fornication. Yeah. So, you know, I, I have a book I'd like to send you a free copy, Joe, if you'd like it. And it's called Marriage, Divorce, and Remarriage. And it covers this from the Bible perspective. And it uh, took a lot of time thinking through the Bible teachings and looking at some, some other good uh, commentaries on this. I think you'll find it helpful. Anyone out there, if you're wondering, what does the Bible say about marriage, divorce, and remarriage? And also some principles to having a happy, and uh, not to endure marriage, but to enjoy your marriage. The number to call is 800-835-6747. That is the resource phone line. Ask for the book called Marriage, Divorce, and Remarriage, and we'll send it out to you. We've got uh, Jeff listening from um, Iowa. Jeff, welcome to the program. Why, good evening. Thank you, Pastor uh, Ross and Pastor Bachelor. Yeah, hi, Jeff. Hello. How can we help you tonight? My question, and it's, it's hard for me, it's confusing to me, and when I'm asked, I have a hard time. It relates to Daniel for a chapter 12, verses 11 and 12. More specifically, how do, how do the uh, time frames 1,290 days and 1,335 days relate to the 2,300-day prophecy uh, and the 1,260 days within that. Oh, man, you've asked a big question. It's kind of like, you know, uh, Elijah just said to Elisha, you've asked a hard thing. <laughs> <laughs> the the uh, Daniel 12 has more time prophecies in it in those few verses there than any other place in the Bible. You've got... Uh, 1260 and you've got the 1290 and the 1335 i think the key to understanding those prophecies in daniel 12 it's sort of a summary of a, a, a great battle uh between good and evil that you see happening in other chapters chapter 2 talks about these kingdoms chapter um 7 talks about the prophecy of the four animals yes. chapter 8 it's the goat and the ram covering the same battle between the antichrist little horn power and then you find the little horn also in chapter 7, chapter 8. Then it gives it more detail in chapter 9 when the Messiah comes. Chapter 10, 11, and 12 is sort of one long prophecy. And just maybe to add, uh, you know, I think we're all familiar with the 1260. At least we've, we've heard of that one. That's the, the Dark Ages from 538 till 1798. Uh, the 1290 would begin in uh, the date that's been put forward is 508 which was the conversion of Clovis, king of the Franks. Now, we might think, well, that's not that big of a big deal, but that was rather significant because he was pagan. Before that, he was converted to Christianity, and in essence, the entire nation of France, uh, France became supporters of the papal power, which was necessary mm -hmm. to establish full sovereignty, which occurred uh, in 538. So that's, that's the 1290. So starting in 508, it brings you to 1798, when the papal power received a deadly wound. And then the 1335, starting also in that same time period, 508, it brings you up to 1843, when we have people preaching and teaching and proclaiming the prophecies of Daniel, in particular the 2300 days. Second coming, it's the last age of the church. The church of Laodicea begins about then also. Right. Right. So th that's just a quick summary of that. And uh, I'm just thinking, Pastor Doug, do we have a book? We no, I'm just thinking we need one? a book because we get that question. And yeah, it's, you really need to give a, a book. It's uh, it's too deep to cover in three I've minutes. I've some great articles on that subject, and it's it's very good. It's well, I hope that didn't just compound confusion, Jeff. We appreciate your call. We're going to see if we can squeeze in one more questioner before we run out of our allotted time. We've got uh, Yolanda in Arizona. Yolanda, welcome to the program. Hi. Hi, thank you, Yolanda. We got about two minutes. Can we do it? Yeah, yeah. I'll talk fast. <laughs> okay. Okay. You're um, on. So my question. Uh, okay, uh, my question comes from Genesis chapter nineteen, verse eight. 
mm-hmm. um, with Lot and his daughters, where it says, I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes, only unto these men do nothing. For therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. I just have a problem with Lot <laughs> offering his two daughters that way. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't blame you. Uh, I've got two daughters. <laughs> The um, and, and not only here, but you'll find that the same thing happens in the end of the book of Judges, where this um, this uh, Ephraimite priest, Levite, he he said that when the men of Gibeah surround the house, he says, look, I'll, we'll send out our, our wives, but don't do this. For one thing, it talks about, you know, how God feels about um, that kind of sexual activity uh, where they're going to rape the men. The other thing is. When someone came under your roof in Bible times, you were supposed to lay down your life and everything you had to protect them. It was called sanctuary. They had very strong rules about hospitality. That's why they don't go into Lot's house. They say, send them out. And I also think Lot was kind of thinking, I'll I'll offer you my daughters. He was saying, thinking they'd be ashamed to even ask such a thing, that that would basically make them ashamed and walk away. But it's not what they wanted. And... um, yeah, same thing that happened in the, the story in Judges. And they just had very strong scruples about the the um, teaching of sanctuary. Someone came under your roof for protection. You would do everything you could to uh, watch over them. Um, so I know it is a difficult, <laughs> that's a difficult passage in, in our thinking the way we are today. And... Um, Lot, of course, his daughters didn't have the best influence there in Sodom because they later seduced their own father. Anyway, friends, what a note to end on. (laughs) But, hey, call us next week. We're going to get into more Bible study. You can hear about out of time. Go to amazingfacts.org and keep us going. God bless.